we're not going to wear sunglasses and we're not going to suddenly do any of that stuff. Uh, but I am going to talk to you a little bit about this thing called the matrimonial matrix. Uh, the title of my message today is simply for a starting point. We're going to talk today about the keys, the keys to matrimonial matrix or to the matrimonial matrix, that should actually say. So that slide's not right either. The keys to the matrimonial matrix, because that's what it says in my notes here. Um, uh, I actually looked up the word matrix this week. It's, hard to, it's a hard word to look up. If you Google it, all you get is about this crazy movie. And there's a new one coming out, so now everybody's excited about a movie. It's a movie. I want to talk to you about real life. I want to talk to you about the mess that your marriage is in, not that fabulous movie. When you look up the word matrix, I discovered that the word has literally dozens of meanings. It's, a, it's an incredible word in the English language. Uh, it is, which is how they use it in the movie, it is an arrangement of numbers or symbols in a pattern from top to bottom and from left to right used for solving problems in mathematics. And that's all I can tell you about that because it had a whole bunch of other stuff, but I didn't do well in mathematics or, mathematics or whatever else uh, in school. Once they got to putting letters in with the numbers, I was like, okay, this is crazy. Pi is squared. I'm like, dude, a pi is round. I, I... <laughs> Once they got plas- past that two plus two stuff, you know, uh, they said, Mr. Jones has 11 candy bars. He eats six. What does he have left? I'm like, cavities. That's what I wrote down. <laughs> that's, all I, that's what I got out of that story. Uh, so it is an arrangement of symbols or numbers used to create a ma- uh, solve mathematical problems. It gets really gross from there. The next definition is it's actually the formative tissue at the base of your toenail. Yeah, didn't know that, did you? Next time you ladies are getting a pedicure there, say to the young lady, make sure you clean up the matrix down there. Get that that flesh around the toenail, in other words. Disgusting. It it can be a mass of fine-grained rock which fossils actually slide into and form creating crystals or gems that get embedded in that matrix. It's an enclosure uh, which, which within something originates or develops. And w- when I got to that part, I thought, oh, now it's starting to sound more like a marriage. An enclosure <laughs> which, which within something originates or develops. I thought that sounds more like it. And then it started to give some other definitions, and I'm like, oh, that one really sounds like a marriage. Listen, the set of conditions that provides a system in which something grows or develops. I hope your marriage is a matrix. The matrix is an intersection of two opposites. Woo-hoo! Yeah, there's a lot of us like that. Uh, a matrix is a relationship in which something new develops. You become who you weren't before. You're somebody different because you got married to somebody better. Say amen quickly, men. Amen. The matrix is also a binding substance that keeps two things together which is what I want to talk to you about today. What are the keys that we could use to make our marriage a matrix so that it locks us together and keeps us together? Now, the Bible doesn't call marriage a matrix, uh, but it does call it a mystery. (laughs) And if you've been married for any length of time, you know that it is a mystery. My marriage is a mystery. I'll be married 40 years uh, in just a month on March 1st, I'll be married. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. One, amen. Um, just figuring I'd get a little applause or something there. But anyhow, whatever. Uh, all you people married six months are like, yeah, okay, great. Um, I'll be married 40 years uh, next month. And I can tell you this, my marriage is a mystery. There are lots of parts of it I still don't understand. I don't understand why my wife is still with me. I don't understand that. It's a mystery to me. Other than I told her shortly after we were married that if she ever left me, I would go with her. And maybe that's what keeps her around. I don't know. Uh, Here's what Ephesians says, and then we'll dig into a few steps quickly this morning. Listen, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined and faithfully devoted to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This is this matrix that happens. This mystery of two becoming one is great. It depends how you put the inflection on that word, isn't it? You say, this mystery of two becoming one is great. Or you say, 
It's great. <laughs> but I am speaking, Paul says, with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. It is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. This is not my sermon today, but the Pentecostal preacher in me will not allow me in today's culture to go to the next verse without saying to you, this is what many in our, even our Christian culture don't understand today of why marriage is so holy and sacred. This is why marriage must be between a man and a woman, not between two men or two women. And that's not a statement against a group of people. It's a statement for marriage. Because whenever you step outside what God has orchestrated, what you're doing is you're messing and you are diminishing what marriage really represents. Marriage actually represents the union of us and Christ. And so when you diminish that relationship, you are diminishing what God has established. This is why marriage is important, because it's holy, it's sacred. Amen? So that's not, that's not uninclusive, that's not unloving. That, this is the way God has set it up. And you should not be ashamed of that. That is our defense of marriage. It's not because we're against other people. We're just for what God has established. Say amen, somebody. Amen. However, however, each man among you without exception is to love his wife as his very own self. That's a big demand for someone like me. <laughs> with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her, with an attitude of loving kindness. And the wife, let's not leave you out, ladies, and the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him. Wouldn't that be nice? You, you noticed me. Oh, it's you. <laughs> and prefers him and treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. Father, as we step into this subject matter this morning, would you just help us to uh, regain our focus, regain our thought patterns? God, would you help us to just tune into your word that we might learn something about our marriage, about relationships, about our future, that we might leave this place today saying, I'm blessed that I went into the presence of the Lord, but I've also learned something today that will help me in my everyday life to be a better servant of the King. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have to ask the question today, it's a horrible question to ask, but is it possible anymore for two people who love each other to actually spend their entire lives together? And I know that that seems like in the church that we would never ask that question, but I'm telling you, after pastoring now for coming up on almost 37 years, there was a time when you would not ask that question in the church. It was a given. Today, it is a question that needs to be asked. Do we have the stuff? Do we have the material in us as human beings? Do we still have the character? Do we have enough of his word? Do we have enough integrity? Do we have enough fortitude to say, you know what, I'm going to get into this relationship and it's never going to be perfect and it's not going to be all I wanted it to be, but you know what, I'm in it. Come hell and high water. All the old married people. Now, I know that there are some of you single people here, and some of you perhaps that are single, some of you that have been through a divorce, some of you that, and, and our hearts go out to you if that's the case, and if you're still single here today, I know there are some single people saying, well, I'm going to check out because I don't need this series, you know, I'm not married. Can I tell you something? The person who ought to take notes in this sermon today is a single person. There are some of you married, and you could take notes, but it's too late. I met your husband. It's too late. <laughs> Just saying. Don't tune us out if you're single. Take copious notes. One, it might help you. Two, you might be able to help someone else who's making a big mistake. Uh, so, uh, listen, you might know some people who need this material. You might get married someday yourself in the future. And thirdly, you're going to need some of these principles. Just get along with other people. Everything I'm going to talk about today you could use in a relationship with a friend, with a, with a child. So uh, they're, they're good things, I'm, I'm promising you that. What I'm going to do today first is identify some keys to unlock the marriage matrix. And then the other thing I want to do is I want to help you do a little self-identification, a little self-evaluation. Some of us take our car in for a checkup what, when the light goes on. When the light goes on. I saw someone put on Facebook yesterday, they were making fun of people, which I don't like to do. They were making fun of certain people in a certain arena, and they had a 
person who's relatively famous with a car engine open and she's on the phone saying, I need help. My dipstick doesn't reach the oil anymore. I need a longer one. <laughs> Young people right now are going, what's a dipstick? What is oil? <laughs> I got an electric car. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> that's cool. I love your electric car. But it doesn't go vroom, vroom. Uh, I always say if you had an electric car, do you make noise while you're driving it? Do you go like that? Because yeah. I would. I would have a recording, like I'd play car sound. Anyway, got nothing to do with this. Let's get back over here. See, that first part messed me up. I'm all over the place here. Uh, some of you actually go to a doctor. You get a physical checkup. What we're going to do today is you'll notice on your notes, and I'm not anywhere near a, a blank yet for your notes, but you'll notice next to every point that we're going to look at today, there's an NW and an OK. And what I'm going to ask you to do is this today. Now, don't look over at your spouse's paper, okay? Don't create problems for yourself. But when we hit each point, when we're done, I kind of want you, either today while we're sitting in church, or maybe talk about it together as a couple and kind of score yourselves. And what you ought to come up with is either an NW, which means what? I need work. This needs work. This area in our relationship needs work. Or you're going to check off, hey, I'm okay. Now, most men, once I say this, men will already go down and check off the okay, 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 box. That's not how it works. Listen, God's ideal for marriage is harmony, unity, and intimacy. But unfortunately, that's the ideal, and most of us don't stay there. We go from the ideal, and pretty soon marriage is an ordeal, and eventually we're looking for a new deal, or let's make a deal. But that's not God's goal. God's goal is that you have the keys that unlock the potential of your marriage for it to become all that God wants it to be. If you're married, say amen. amen. Proverbs 4 is not my text, but I can't go any further without it. Don't ever forget my words. Keep them always in mind. They are the keys to life. For they who find them, they bring health to the whole body. We're going to give you five or six if I have time this morning. I hope I finish because people with OCD are really going to be upset. Um, I'm going to give you five or six keys that unlock the matrix of marriage. They unlock the glue that will hold you together. They unlock the door to a new realm where you can live and say, guess what? We're going to stick together. This marriage is going to bind us together and we're going to work out whatever we got to work out. We're going to work through whatever we got to work through for Jesus. Amen. Once I give them to you, you're going to go, duh. A lot of men will start to fall asleep. If you're with your spouse, give them a nudge every once in a while. When he looks at you, just go, I love you. Just, just do that, all right? Um, key number one, if you want to open the door to a lasting relationship, key number one is communication. It is the number one issue. It is the number one problem. It is the number one important thing that you could build and work on in your relationship. Proverbs 13 says an unreliable wicked messenger can cause a lot of trouble. Reliable communication permits progress. Whenever we miscommunicate, huh, don't raise your hands. I, I told you I've been married almost 40 years. I've been in a lot of trouble sometimes in my marriage and most of the time it's because it's about miscommunication. I thought she said, I thought you meant, oh, that's this Tuesday? If you've been married a long time and you're a man, you have had this conversation in your home when you're getting ready on a Friday night to go somewhere you don't want to go, it's the last place you'd ever be on the earth, and you say something stupid like, I don't know why we're even going. And your wife says to you, I asked you four weeks ago, and you said, fine. And our answer as a man is, yes, four weeks ago it was fine. Tonight it's not fine. I didn't think we were really going to have to go. <laughs> Again, I saw it on Facebook. It's my house. It was a man talking. He says, <laughs> I don't know why my wife waits till I'm at the other end of the house to ask me. Listen, if you want to make progress in your relationship, you have to learn how to talk with each other. We know from studies that have been on 85% of all marriage problems include some kind of communication breakdown. 
This is the reason why my wife and I, we send out every Friday, every Friday in this church, we send out, gosh, you get a selah every day, you get prayers on Facebook. There's no excuse for I can't grow in Christ. And every Friday we send out a thing called together. We write it kind of funny. To the word two and then gather. We send out two gather for married couples, engaged couples, couples living in sin together. We, we send it to everybody. We don't discriminate, okay? We, we send it to everybody. And, and every week what we say on the bottom of it is, hey, look, we hope these shared thoughts and words cause you to at least just talk to each other. I, I got to tell you, as a pastor, every couple, every couple that I've met with for the last five years in my office that are having marital problems, when I ask them, have you guys been reading together? They look at each other and go, no. And I know that it sounds goofy, and I know you think, well, that would really fix our marriage. No, if you've got problems, you need more than together. But I am telling you this, if you read together, it'll help you talk every week. Some of you can sit down and read it together. Some of you can read it separately, and then maybe while you're at dinner on Friday. Listen, don't you run out of stuff to talk about with the person you're with all the time? I'm the only one? Oh, I'm going to be so honest in this series. I literally make a list sometimes on Friday. My wife and I were going to dinner Friday night, and I started to tell her something in the car. It was a really good thing, and it was really cool, and I was like, oh, I got to tell And I was like, no, wait, I'm not going to tell you that. She's like, what? I said, I got to save that for dinner. I'll have nothing to say. I got to save that for the restaurant. I'll I have nothing to say otherwise. Why? Because we see each other every day. We live pretty, you know, we live in the same house. <laughs> we see each other every day, and as you run out of stuff to say, so sometimes you just need something to talk about. Sometimes my wife and I, we send out the together. Some Friday nights, I'll pick one thing out of the together. And I'll say, hey, did you read that today? Yeah, well, we'll read it together in the morning. But this was really, and we'll just talk about it. It's not about fixing your marriage. It's about preventing a problem through communication. One of very good friends of ours in the church, um, really nice couple. And uh, uh, his wife sent my wife uh, a message this week. I think they got a screenshot of it. Can you put that photograph up? This is the screenshot uh, that she sent my wife. She, this is her to her husband. She said, me, babe, I sent you the link to Together. We need to start reading it. John, but I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. My wife gave me this. I'm, I'm preaching on this Sunday. My wife said, look at this. M me, this is the wife. Look, it's preventative. It's preventative. Communication is about preventing a problem. Now, it'll also help you get out of problems. Listen, good, you like that, don't you, huh, yeah. I can't, they're going to be here in second service. I didn't ask their permission, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> if you send me something, it's mine. Don't send me stuff. I'm just, listen, good, honest, clear communication is the bridge between confusion and clarity. And we all have different communication styles. We all have different needs. Um, it's actually been researched. This is an actual fact. On average, the average man speaks 20,000 words a day. The average woman, I'm not making fun, I'm just, these are stats, all right? The average woman speaks 30,000 words a day. Women just have more to say. They communicate differently. Nothing wrong with that. And listen, it, 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 it was just, look, he stole my joke, listen. One woman, when I said that one day in my office, a woman said, well, the reason I got to speak 10,000 more words is because I got to say a lot of things twice just for him. <laughs> It's okay. No, it's good. They're usually good. They're usually good. They're good. Uh, uh, listen, here's what Ephes Paul goes on to say this. He says, do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the needs and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. Can, can I give you one word of warning before I move on? Listen, speak honestly and communicate the best you know how. Because one thing that causes problems is when we begin to speak in riddles or send <clears throat> hidden messages. Occasionally, occasionally, someone, a woman, will perhaps say to her husband, don't raise your hands if you're a man, you've heard this. I shouldn't have to tell you this. I love when my wife says that to me. I shouldn't need to tell you this. And, and I say to her, yes, you should need to tell me this. I can't read your mind. And my wife says, you can't be that dumb. And I'm like, listen, you need to know. Yes, I am. I am that dumb. You need to tell me what you really want. Don't, I can't, this game, I can't, you just, just tell me. I'll get it. But you got to write it down. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong, Matthew says. 
We must learn to listen with curiosity and speak with honesty. Amen? The supreme flaw with much of our interpersonal communication is that we don't listen to understand, we listen to answer. We're waiting for it to stop so we can say what we want to say. When we listen with curiosity, we don't listen with intent of just replying. We listen for what's actually behind the words. The number one key that will open the door to a lasting relationship in your life is your communication skills with each other. We sell a ton of books out there on communication. There's a hundred things you could read. It's not hard. I know you think it's impossible, but it isn't. Uh, There are books for dummies like me, and it'll teach you how to communicate more clearly. Give yourself an NW or an OK. If there's anybody here that puts an OK, you're an idiot. (laughs) I put an NW on mine, and I communicate for a living. We all need to work on communication. Amen? Key number two, uh, consideration. You must be considerate. Uh, of your husband and your wife. Consideration means not only thinking of yourself, but start thinking of we instead of me. Uh, We did a series one February. Usually every February we do some kind of marriage or love. You know, it's the love month. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's the love month. Valentine's Day. I I urge you believers by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you be in full agreement in what you say And that there be no division or factions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about matters, certainly of the faith. That ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind. That's the King James. That you have the same mind. The message translation says you must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. The best husbands, the best workers, the best leaders, the best teachers, the best pastors, the best politicians have a... (laughs) super high consideration factor. They really care about their people. The best teacher you ever had was not the smartest teacher you ever had. It was the teacher that cared. Um, I had some really smart teachers when I was a kid, but every once in a while I would get one that cared. And in my life, they made a difference because smart teachers and me didn't really get along. Uh, Listen, God's purpose in your marriage, here's a shock, ready? God's purpose in your marriage is not to make you happy. That is a benefit of it, hopefully, but it's not the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. Because when you get into a marriage, you don't get your way all the time, or even anymore. You have to learn to be considerate. So marriage is a school of consideration, learning to be unselfish. You... you, (laughs) You learn it there, I believe, more than any other place. I meet guys sometimes who sit in my office and they're like, you know, yeah, I'm getting married, you know, but I still want like my own time. I still want to go out with the boys. I still want to hang out with the dudes, you know. I still need like my night, you know, I still got to go out. Here's what I would tell you. If that's your attitude, you're not mature enough to get married yet. I'm just telling you, slow down, just slow down. Ladies, I'm getting married, but you know, I still got my girls. Like we still got our night. I'm not saying it's wrong to go out with your girlfriends or whatever. I'm just telling you this knows if you're married, it's now about each other. It's not about all the other people. It's time to say goodbye to them. Oh, I love the way you're shouting, I'll tell you. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, with great gentleness and tact, and with an intelligent regard for the marriage relationship. As with someone physically weaker, this is not about machoism. Since she is a woman, show her honor and respect as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. Do you know, gentlemen, that actually the tone of voice that you use with your wife can actually hinder your conversation with Christ? If you are cutting and unkind, if you are belittling in that conversation, when you pray, your prayer becomes ineffective. Why? Because God says, I I can't even talk to you right now. (laughs) Sounds like your wife, doesn't he? I can't even talk to you right now. Go fix that. Uh, uh, One of my favorite theologians to quote, since I can't use Spurgeon anymore, is Winnie the Pooh. (laughs) Winnie the Pooh says, a little consideration, a little thought for others makes all the difference. It does, doesn't it? It makes all the difference. Robert Brault says, today I bent the truth to be kind, and I have no regret, for I am far surer of what is kind than I am of what is true. I'm not encouraging you to lie to your wife, but when she says to you, do I look good in this? Just pause and learn to be considerate. Does this make my butt look big? 
Every man has been asked that question. It's a death trap. It's an absolute death trap. Do you mean any bigger? Do you mean, do you mean? <laughs> the safe answer if you're a man is, how could that get any bigger or look bigger? Sometimes I even miss it, it's so small. It's not very spiritual and it's not, I, I get it, I know, I know we should be honest, but that's probably one of, the, my, one of my favorite quotes I've ever given from this podium. Today I bent the truth to be kind and I have no regrets because I am far surer of what is kind than I am of what is the truth. Sometimes we're so truth, we forget to be kind. Imagine if this week you gave yourself to permission to be outrageously kind to your spouse. What if you extended as much goodwill and kindness as you possibly could manage to every person that you meet or interact with? What, what if you did it with no thought of reward? I'm, I'm absolutely sure of this one thing. It'll be, it'll be one of the best, most fabulous weeks you've ever had in all your life. Key number one is communication. Key number two is consideration. And I've got to move quickly over these next few Number three, key number three is compromise. If you have been married longer than a day, you know that every single marriage has conflict. There are just some things you're never going to see eye to eye about. You're never going to agree on everything. As you begin your marriage, there's going to be a thousand things that you're going to have to compromise, to meet in the middle, to be flexible, to be willing to give up. The Bible says a house, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. A constantly squabbling family just disintegrates. Can I, and I, listen, again, I'm speaking out of 40 years of marriage. The majority of things that we argue or fuss about, they're just unimportant. When you boil it all down, they're just not that big of an issue. He doesn't pick his clothes up. Okay, I know it's a problem. But he's not leaving them at his girlfriend's house. Just saying. Just saying. This is why a lot of people don't come to me for counseling or advice. Because I've given that advice to I can't tell you how many women who have said to me, he just doesn't pick up after himself. He just leaves his clothes, leaves his underwear in the middle of the floor. It's just gross. It's just disgusting. I'm like, look, he's not leaving him at his girlfriend's house. And I'm like, <laughs> Pastor, you says I'm hard to live with. I said, you are. We just met and you are. Like you wanted to make an appointment to come and see the pastor because he leaves his underpants on the floor. Just put yours next to his and have some fun. I'm just telling you. Just have some fun. I can fix almost anything. Compromise works. <laughs> listen, all, listen, virtually all conflict can be traced back to one issue. Selfishness. I, I want what I want. I don't want you to do what you're doing. I want what I want. That's where most arguments arise. Um, Proverbs 18.1 says, People who do not get along with others are interested only in themselves. Go ahead and give yourself a NW or a OK on that one. How, how is my compromise? Listen, compromise is not about winning or losing. It's about deciding that the other person in this relationship has just as much right to be happy with the end result as you do. To compromise is the work of mature, loving people. It's not that big of a deal. Let's compromise. It's going to drive me crazy. No, it's not. Only if you let it. Just learn to let it go and let God. Amen? Amen. And men right now are smiling. Oh, God, I'm going to leave my underwear on the floor today, baby. I'm just telling <laughs> And ladies, listen, you, you will never nag him into doing that anyway. I'm telling you the, only way you, the only way you get a man to do anything is with influence, not with power. Men don't respond to power. They respond to influence. And you have influence. I've told you. Ask him. Leave his underwear around? Talk to him in your underwear. He will listen. <laughs> Don't nag at him when he's going out there. I can't believe you left a mess. No, just walk out in your underwear. Hey, can I talk to you about your underwear? 
Yeah, absolutely. What do you want to talk about? What do you want to talk about? Any, uh, talk about anything. I I'm not even going to work. I'm, I quit. I just quit my job. I called him. I'm not coming back. I'm right here for you. I'm here for you, baby. I'm listening to you. I'm sure, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not being flippant, but look, we're all adults. No, I, people say to me, Pastor, my husband won't read together. I'm telling you, some Saturday morning, make two cups of coffee, sit there in your best robe, <laughs> and he'll sit and talk to you about together. I'm telling you. Women have power. Ladies, you have influence. My seven-year-old grandson came to my house. You can't believe how many things happened in one week for me that I'm like, sermon, sermon. Uh, my seven-year-old grandson came to my house on Friday from the Christian school that he goes to, Christian Heritage. So even in Christian schools, there's issues, I'm just telling you. And he had a big black magic marker stripe down his face like this. And I said to him, hey, buddy, we're doing Legos. And I said, hey, I said, what, what happened to your face? You got magic marker on your face. Yeah, I know, Papa. I said, well, how did you get magic marker on your face? I said, it's, Papa, it's not magic marker, it's dry erase. I said, well, whatever it is, how do you get that on your face? How do you draw it and you get that on your face? Oh, Papa... And I'm like, he seemed a little evasive. So I'm like, okay, what's going on? You know, I'm like, dude, seriously, how did you get that on your face? Oh, Papa, I don't know what the word is. What's the word? What's the word that you use when, you know, like a girl is trying to make you do something? <laughs> he said, Papa, what's that word? Ah, dare. That's it. He said, there's a girl in school. And she's one of my friends, and she dared me to do this on my face. I said, Brody, if she dared you to jump off the building, are you going to do it? And he went, well, no, Pop. I went, yeah, you will, buddy. You will. <laughs> you you will. You're toast. <laughs> and then, bless his little heart, he said to me, Papa, but he said, my best friend, one of my best friends in school, I think his name's Jamar, he said, my best friend Jamar, he didn't want me to feel bad, so he drew on his face as well. I thought that was the nicest little thing I've ever heard. And then when my wife came home, she said to me, do you know j -Mar? I said, no, I don't know j -Mar. She said, he's black. <laughs> so while I appreciate the, j the, the, the gesture, j -Mar, I don't know that it was like the saying. <laughs> Just saying, all right? Us white people got problems too, okay? compromise. The keys are communication, consideration, compromise. I, I got to let you go home. N number four, I've already talked enough about this, so just write it down. Contact. It takes communication, it takes consideration, it takes compromise, but it also takes contact. I'm talking about physical touch. I'm talking about affection. You can call it cuddling, caressing, but you must touch to keep in touch. Ooh, I wish I wrote that down. From the time you were born, you and I needed holding. It, they have a syndrome for children that are not held. It's not healthy for them. They can suffer long-term emotional effect if they're not held. You know that if a baby's a, a, a pre-born, a, 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 a preemie baby, one of the first things they do is, e even a man, you got to take your shirt off, put the baby on skin, those, let, the, let that baby feel skin, in other words. That's when we're born. Can I tell you something? That doesn't go away. You need somebody to hug you. You need, I, I, I'm, I'm a hugger. I, I probably shouldn't be, but I'm just a hugger. I, I like to grab people and hug people. And, and I, I'm a, I don't do it with women. I, I, I get that. But I'm just a hugger, in other words. It doesn't bother me to hug a guy. I'm, I'm secure in my manhood. And I can hug a guy. And it's not like full frontal, like rubbing, hugging, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> Just like a hug and out, you know? <laughs> Just like a hug and out, in other words. I didn't want you to get the wrong idea. <laughs> Here's what I believe is you, you got to figure out how to still court and date your spouse, male and female. And that takes contact. If you're p too busy to date your mate, you are too busy. I believe if they were more courting in marriage, there would be fewer marriages in court. I know the old excuse, I've heard it many times, well, you know, I just don't feel like it. I, I don't feel like being affectionate. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it right now. And, and I get it, men and women's needs are different, and, and the seasons of marriage change. 
Oh, I can't get any blunter than that with you. I'm just, the seasons of marriage change. I get it. But there still has to be affection. There still has to be that connection. And, and listen, I will tell you this. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than it is to feel your way into an action. Can I say that again? I wish I'd put it on the screen. You see, the problem is, is that some people say, well, I just don't feel like it. If you wait till you feel like it, you may never hug. If you wait till you feel like having some kind of relationship with your spouse, it, it may never happen. So, so, Pastor, you mean like sometimes we should be affectionate even if we don't feel like it? Yes. Because you need contact with each other. Listen, feelings always follow behavior. If you act in a loving way, if you act in a romantic way, if you act in an affectionate way, the feelings will come back. Don't wait for the feelings. Just do the right thing and never let a day go by without some kind of physical contact. It is easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into action. So hold hands. My mom and dad will be here in second service. My dad's 85. My mother's 84. Now, my mom's in a wheelchair now, but uh, if you saw them when my mom doesn't have a wheelchair, uh, just a year ago, my mom and dad would pull up out here, my dad will come around, and he still opens the door for my mom. And he'll take her, and they'll walk hand in hand. Someone saw them a little while ago, look at them. They're holding hands, and they're walking in a church, in other words. And and I kind of chuckled, because I thought, (laughs) what you don't know is that my parents have been married long enough, 65 years they were married just a week ago. Uh, and, And so... Uh, they've been married long enough where the scripture has come to bear that the two shall become one flesh. The reason they're holding hands is because they fall over if they let go. (laughs) That's really what's going on right there. I'm just telling you. (laughs) An attorney friend of mine told me that a woman came into his law office seeking a divorce, and she said, listen, I don't only want a divorce. I want him to hurt. He's hurt me. I want to hurt him. I want my pound of flesh. I need to hurt him badly. So the attorney said, well, I don't, I don't always advise that, but if that's what you want to do, let me give you this advice. He said, here's what I want you to do. Go home and give him no inclination that you're going to divorce him. Go home and compliment him every day until I can get the papers drawn up. Tell him all the good things that he's done and smother him with affection. I know I don't feel like it, but be affectionate. Act like you really adore him. Then on the day we serve him, it'll crush him. She came back two months later. She said, forget the paperwork. We've fallen back in love. Sometimes you got to act your way into a feeling. True intimacy surpasses the physical. It's a feeling of closeness. I, I, I jump. Let me go back. I don't want to leave that verse out. I'm rushing, but I, I, I got time. Listen, the husband must fulfill his marital duty to his wife. I'm telling you, you can't make these things up that happen to me. It's only me. 5,000 other pastors could read that and not get an amen. <laughs> the husband must fulfill his marital duty to his wife with good, goodwill and kindness, and likewise the wife to her husband. Do not deprive each other of matrimonial rights or marital rights, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves unhindered to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you to sin because of your lack of self-control. It's an important part of the marriage matrix. Contact, intimacy. True intimacy surpasses the physical. It is a feeling of closeness that isn't just about proximity, but about belonging. It's a beautiful emotional space in which two become one. To have another human being understand your mind is a different kind of intimacy. Amen? Amen. Secrecy and deception are the enemies of intimacy. Every healthy relationship is built on a foundation of honesty and trust. I'm moving quickly. Listen, sexual happiness is an important part of a great relationship. The keys to matrimonial matrix are (laughs) communication, consideration, compromise, contact, and fifth, and I'm done, commitment. Commitment. Write it down, commitment. Listen, if you've been married 20 plus years, check off the okay box. (laughs) You're not done, but you check the box. If, if, you, if you stuck with him for 20 years, God bless you. Check the box. <laughs> if you've put up with her, just check that box right now. Put a smiley face there. Listen, if you're only going to take one word that would best summarize the whole marriage relationship, I believe it's not the word love. 
it would be the word commitment. Any two people given the right circumstances, the right environment, can develop romantic, loving feelings towards each other. That's why dating is a lie. It is. I'm sorry. Dating's a lie. Men, we lie. We, we're on our best behavior. We shower. I'm serious. I, I, every, every couple I've ever married knows, are you guys reading together? Yes, we're reading it every week. They get married, they stop reading it. You read it before? Yeah, because why? You were lying. That wasn't really you. Uh, but that's not really at the heart of marriage. In fact, the difference between marriage and just living together is actually commitment. Amen? Now listen, divorce is a reality in our world, and there are many people in our church who have been through the painful experience of divorce. And our hearts go out to you, and we thank God for His grace and His love to forgive us for even a past a, a mistake in our lives. Would you say amen, please? Amen. I don't often sell a book, but i got a book here today. And if you are a divorced person, if you are in a second relationship, I highly recommend this book. It's called The Heart of Remarriage. It's an interesting book. Now listen to me. If you're married and in a great relationship, sir, do not go out and buy this book in the foyer today, all right? This will be your death knoll, I'm just telling you, all right? But if you're in a second marriage or out of a marriage and looking to enter into another, I highly recommend you read this book. It's very, very informative. A lot of second marriages don't work because we bring the stuff from the old relationship into the new relationship. Listen, you will never build strong, intimate marriage relationships when divorce is always an option. People today get married with this kind of backdoor trap. If it doesn't work out, you know, bump, we'll just get out. If you're carrying around keys and one of them says divorce, that, that's not a commitment. When you, when you stand before God, what you got to say is, this is till death do us part. You say, okay, well, then I'm going to have to kill him. Well, <laughs> work that out, but I'm just... I got three slides. I'll let you go home and watch. This means that the marriage relationship must be meant primarily on covenant commitment, not on feelings of romantic love. Romantic love is important, but the foundation of marriage is a commitment of the will. Commitment is what holds a couple together through the difficulties that will invariably come into your life. A Christian couple should never use the threat of divorce as leverage in a conflict. Your wife is your companion by covenant. Divorce mars the picture of Christ's eternal covenant love for the church. So when you divorce, you're not just hurting that person or your children. You're actually hurting God. This is why God says he hates divorce. Jesus replied, have you never read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother shall be joined inseparably to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Marriage is not a commitment to feel love, but a commitment to daily make the choice to show love. You should take a picture of that, I'm just telling you. I got one more slide. Commitment is an act and not a word. Without commitment, you, can have, you, can have depth. you cannot have depth in anything, whether it's a relationship, a business, a hobby. A successful marriage requires falling in love many times, but always with the same person. <laughs> Amen? And I end with a rather negative slide, but I just want you to know where we stand as a church on this issue. So take a picture if you ever wondered. Listen. When we as human beings say, I just don't love you anymore, or I just don't love you like I used to, it's actually and often presented in a way that actually makes us sound authentic and honest. That's the church world we live in. I'm just being honest with my feelings. I just don't love you anymore. It actually even sounds courageous, like I'm going to be brave and be the first one to say this. In reality, we simply are confessing our sinfulness. We're admitting we only loved because of an emotional reward or some physical payoff. We're owning that we are petty little consumers who believe people only have as much value as the whimsical entertainment they provide for us in a moment or for a season. We are not lovers at all. We are users. Love is a choice and a commitment based on the value that others have as as created by and loved by God. If it diminishes our love, it is cause for repentance, not abandonment. It's cause for repentance. I don't love you anymore. Then you've changed. Your heart has changed. 
and you're making the wrong choices, surrender it to God and repent. He can rekindle love. I've seen it a million times. I've seen it a million times. Father, help us today. I've preached too long, but I don't care. I pray, God, you help every marriage in this church. I pray against the forces of darkness that would seek to tear couples apart. I pray, God, that you'd help every man, woman, an individual in this building realize the importance of marriage and why it's important. And I pray, God, that you would help us build marriages that are a matrix. They are not easily torn apart. They are not something we walk away from. We do the math and we work it out for the kingdom. And I pray this and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you, New Life. God bless you.